Okay, online dating. I really don't know how you guys do it. My God, I did not grow up in that world. I'm too old. But of course, um, everybody younger than me sort of lives in that world. And when I look at that stuff, I just think, well, how does anybody get through this? Although I do know that it can be successful. So I'm, I know that it works on occasion, but it also just seems like a f killing fields of misery <laughs> and humiliation. All right, so we're off to a good start. I wanna talk about love today and question of what can we learn from biologists about love and romance. And I, I think that this is particularly interesting because some biologists, some neuroscientists have actually been consultants in the design of online dating apps. And so we bring that knowledge to bear when we sort of think about structuring the app in such a way that it will activate the right kind of feelings and draw the right kind of attention and keep away the wrong kind of attention, whatever that is. And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit, but I want to bring in a lot of sort of what we know from primate mating and romance, if we can call it uh, romance, and even child rearing. And it's fascinating stuff because I bet you don't know some of the mating patterns of chimpanzees and bonobos and how it relates to us. When it comes to love, humans think they're sophisticated. We've got poetry, we've got these online dating algorithms. We've got ethical debates about monogamy versus polygamy versus polyamory. But beneath all the candlelight dinners and all the heart emojis, our mating instincts are still sort of primate-like, animal-like. And if you want to understand human romance and family, then you've got to spend some time uh, with our cousins, the chimpanzees and the bonobos. Their dating lives are messier than reality TV shows, and they're sort of way more revealing. So today on Professor Asma's Guide to Unusual Knowledge, chimp and bonobo sex, and what it means for human beings. Welcome. Humans are primates. Basically, human beings are great apes. We share a common ancestor with chimps and bonobos about five to seven million years ago. We've grown massive neocortexes or neocortices, and we've developed sort of complex cultures, and we've invented things like Tinder, but uh, we still carry the biological toolkit of a primate. And biology still shapes how we mate, how we date, well, I guess in how we, let's do it in a different order, how we date and then how we mate and then how we raise kids. Okay, chimpanzees live in multi-male, multi-female groups. So mating is competitive. Males form dominance hierarchies and high-ranking males get more mating opportunities. Status isn't everything. Sneaky, sort of lower-ranking males can form alliances with females offering protection or food in exchange for mating. In fact, you know, until we started to study chimps more carefully, we didn't realize what meat eaters they were. And they are, they eat a lot of meat. But oftentimes with chimps, they will use the meat as a sort of, in a kind of sexual politics move. They'll oftentimes bring meat to a female that they want to copulate with, and they'll use it as a way to sort of leverage a mating opportunity. And this is fairly common among chimpanzees but it's not common among bonobos, which we're gonna to get to in a moment. Bonobos eat a lot more readily accessible fruit and they live near a lot of this fruit. And so there isn't the kind of competition for uh, nutrients like you have in the chimpanzee ecology. And so there's a different dynamic. The males aren't trying to coax female bonobos using food. So we're gonna to get to that in a moment. But now back to chimps, if we think about this where multiple high-ranking males and some low-ranking males are mating with the same females, it raises what's sometimes called the paternity problem. Males don't know which of the offspring are theirs biologically. This uncertainty is actually a strategy. It reduces the risk of infanticide. If a male might be the father, he's less likely to kill the infant. Still, in some cases, high-ranking males do commit infanticide, eliminating rivals' offspring so the mother becomes fertile again. It's brutal, but evolutionarily, it kind of does work. Now here's how it works. Oftentimes what will happen is a lone male will come in to a group from outside, from another group. So you're sort of chimps engage in what's called fusion and fission. 
social dynamics where they come together, they separate again, they come together. And so groups will eventually end up mixing with each other. So let's say a male comes in and this is not just true of primates, but this is true of a lot of mammals. So grizzly bears do this, uh, lions do this. It's very common among the mammal where a lot of some rodents do this too. A male will enter, find uh, mothers and their infants, their babies, and then it will kill the infants. What that does is now the mother is no longer uh, producing milk because there's no uh, offspring that are suckling. And when you stop producing milk, then basically you go back into estrus. And so now you become basically fertile. You become capable of being impregnated by a new male. And so now the new male will impregnate the female. And so now you get a new litter, but this new litter is this interloper, this newly arrived aggressive male. It's his genetic offspring. And as I said, this is a fairly common problem. Now, it's a bit of an arms race. So the males are basically engaging in this horrific activity. It's pretty widespread. The females have this interesting sort of countermeasure or counterstrike, which is they'll confuse paternity so that males don't know which ones are theirs. And therefore the theory is that they will err on the side of caution and not kill the offspring because they're not sure is this mine or not. And so that's one theory as to why there's this kind of mating style that you see among chimps. Now, bonobos, on the other hand, are our sort of other closest relatives. They took a very different evolutionary path. Where chimps use aggression to solve disputes, bonobos use sex. I should point out that the reason why male bodies generally are bigger uh, among mammals is because this intermale competition requires uh, aggression and fights. And therefore the males in these co competitive kinds of cultures end up being bigger than females. If you look at bonobos, there's less sexual dimorphism. Males and females are more like the same size because there isn't the same kind of battling that happens. I should point out also that this is, while many people are inclined to think, well, this is typical toxic masculinity, <laughs> you know, um, males are always fighting and so forth and it's testosterone. That's probably true, but if you look at testosterone in another context, like in hyena culture, you'll find that there you have a matriarchal society. And so the female rules in, in hyena society. And that means when, since they have to battle each other, females are actually bigger than males and they have a lot more testosterone in their bodies. So what the calculus or the logic seems to be is if you have to have competition for sexual access, then testosterone will basically cause a larger body, a stronger, more aggressive body. And that doesn't necessarily respect the ordinary classifications of XY versus XX uh, biology. So that's just an interesting side puzzle and uh, it's just fascinating. All right, so back to bonobos. They basically will mate with each other all the time, constantly. In fact, it's hard to have these in the zoo because when you, and there's an exhibit in Milwaukee, which I took my son to and like, there's these parents like me with my kid and we're trying to look at the bonobos and all they're doing is basically having sex with each other. Like the whole everything, like masturbation, oral penetration, it's all going on. So, and your kid's looking at this like, what's going on? So maybe it's a good place to have the birds and the bees talk. Uh, in any case, so you, you don't just have kind of typical male-female sex for procreation. You have male-male, female-female, old, young. It's all part of the social glue that bonobos use. Bonobo societies are female-centered. Females form strong bonds and together they keep males in check. Mating is more frequent and far less tied to ovulation, which keeps paternity extremely uncertain. And so therefore infanticide goes way down. It's almost non-existent among bonobos. They're oftentimes thought of as like the hippies of, of the primate world. And that is probably overdoing it, but they are, compared to chimps, they're less aggressive. So what can these apes teach us about human love? Like chimps, human males have historically competed for status and resources because those things can improve mating opportunities. Like bonobos though, we use intimacy also sort of for social bonding, not just reproduction. So humans engage like all other animals in a pair bonding. We've come to call this marriage 
or partnership. But humans are kind of unusual among mammals for forming such long-term pair bonds. Often the partnership is entered into to better raise a highly dependent offspring. I mean, human beings are extremely helpless when they're young. Arguably, they're still helpless when they're older, but our babies are born very dependent with years of expensive brain growth ahead of them. So if you compare human beings to chimps, let's say, uh, chimps are born with something like 75, 80% of their brain wiring already done. Like they're born with all these synaptic connections made. Whereas human beings are born much more prematurely compared to chimpanzees. We have neoteny, which means we preserve these sort of juvenile characteristics, including an underdeveloped brain. The reason for this is because the brain is so big compared to other animals and it has to get down the woman's birth canal. So, you know, you have your skull sort of in this jigsaw skull parts so that when you're coming down the birth canal, the skull can kind of be malleable and flexible. It's not totally hardened together yet. That doesn't happen until you're older. That's why babies have that soft spot at the top of their skull. And so what happens is you need to get this big brain down the birth canal and out. And so that means that most human beings are born uh, prematurely in terms of evolutionary timing. And then we develop and finish all these synaptic connections. We don't really ever finish them, but a lot of them get completed after we're born in the world of our social life with caregivers, mothers and others. We have mothers, we have fathers, we have alloparents like cousins, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, grandparents. So human beings are sort of raised by all these people. And it makes this cooperation between parents in particular uh, kind of important because the job is just so much harder for human beings, human, human mothers. Chimp mothers also do a lot of work. They also will oftentimes be close with their offspring for almost seven or eight years before that offspring goes off and has its own life. And so that's also, you can see there's a kind of precursor in chimps for this kind of long-term child rearing. So in many human societies, the like certainty about paternity also became a big deal. So that's why there are some cultural norms like marriage contracts, uh, chastity taboos, and even inheritance laws. These are like our way of having sort of cultural solutions to the same biological challenges that chimps and bonobos face. But humans also create these kind of ethical systems around romance. Sort of we have ideals of fidelity, love, fairness, way beyond anything in the primate playbook. We can choose to override biology um, or we can collaborate with it. But I think it's probably best if we, if we don't ignore it altogether. It seems highly relevant to our lives, not just as romantic partners, but also as parents. So yes, write love songs, build dating apps, and pen marriage vows. But the script we're following is very old. It was drafted in the forests and savannas of Africa, in the politics of primate tribes, and in the long dependency of our big-brained babies. Understanding that script doesn't make romance less magical, it makes it more fascinating. Because in every kiss, every crush, every messy breakup, there's a little chimp and a little bonobo inside us all. <laughs> okay. I'm glad you came and made it to the end of primate sexuality and human bonding. And now go forth and multiply, as they say, and come back here next week after you've been multiplying for another episode of Professor Asma's Guide to Unusual Knowledge. I'll see you next time, and always stay curious.